立法会会议。Good morning. The regular council meeting now commences. Members, in view of the severe epidemic, this council meeting is again conducted as a remote meeting. I wish to remind members that while you are participating in the meeting, you must keep the video on and show your faces. Government bills first reading. Appropriation Bill 2022. Employment and Retirement Schemes Legislation Offsetting Arrangement Amendment Bill 2022. Second reading, Financial Secretary. Mr. President, honorable members and fellow citizens, good morning. I move that the appropriation bill 2022 be read a second time. The COVID-19 pandemic has plagued the entire world for two years, taking a heavy toll on economic activities and people's way of life. Since the middle of last year, the epidemic situation in Hong Kong had been brought under control with economic activities and daily life gradually getting back to normal. Nevertheless, with the emergence of a virus variant in the past month or so, the, the epidemic situation in Hong Kong has taken a drastic turn for the worse. The rapid spread of the virus and its profound impacts have dealt a heavy blow to many people, disrupting both their life and work, and seriously affected the operations of small and medium enterprises, thus undermining confidence in the future. A gloomy atmosphere enveloped the Hong Kong community. Taking prompt action to stabilize the, the epidemic is crucial for safeguarding the health and lives of our people. It's also the key to maintaining people's confidence and stabilizing our economy. The care and guidance of the central government, together with the selfless support from relevant departments and municipal governments, have bolstered the solidarity, confidence, and indomitable spirit of the Hong Kong SAR government and all sectors of the community. By making a concerted effort to fight the epidemic on all fronts and at full speed, we will surely win this battle against the virus. We will deploy all available resources and take all necessary measures to fully support the anti-epidemic work. The resources allocated for this cause in this budget alone involve more than $54 billion. At this critical time, we need to direct more resources to relieve people's hardship and provide SMEs with some breathing space to stabilize the economy and maintain public confidence. This is also what the general public expects of the government. With this in mind, this year's budget will continue to adopt an expansionary fiscal policy with initiatives mainly focusing on four areas. A, supporting an all-out effort to win the fight against the, the epidemic. B, relieving the hardship of our people and SMEs. C, rendering support to the struggling economy and fostering post-epidemic economic revival and D, investing for the future by planning ahead for the medium and long-term development of our economy. It is estimated that the counter-cyclical measures costing a total of over $170 billion mentioned in the budget, together with the spending in infrastructure projects and other items, will have a fiscal stimulus effect of boosting the economy by around three percentage points. I will elaborate the details afterwards. In 2021, with the rollout of vaccination schemes around the world, as well as the strong fiscal and monetary support, global economic activities revived remarkably. The International Monetary Fund estimated that the global economy staged a strong rebound by 5.9% last year. Given the sharp rebound in demand from major economies, Production and trading activities in Asia were vibrant. Hong Kong's total exports of goods continue to register strong growth with a notable increase of 19% in real terms for the year as a whole and surpassing the high in 2018 by 10.9%. As regional trade flows remain active, exports of transport services reverted to growth. Exports of financial services also showed further growth. Consequently, Hong Kong's total exports of services registered a mild growth of 1.1% for the year, but it was still far below the pre-recession level, with inbound tourism virtually at a standstill. The local epidemic situation remained stable during the period from May 2021 to end 2021, and the employment and income conditions continued to improve. These, coupled with the boost from the consumption voucher scheme, contributed to a, to a rebound of private consumption expansion by 5.6% for the year as a whole. As business outlook turned positive, investment expansion rose by 10.1%. 
Hong Kong's overall economy saw a visible recovery in 2021 with a growth of 6.4%, reversing the declining trend in the past two consecutive years. The seasonally adjusted unemployment rate dropped substantially from a high of 7.2% early last year to 3.9% in the latest period. Given the continued recovery of the local economy and the accelerated rise in import prices, consumer price inflation increased progressively in 2021. However, owing to the fall in private housing rentals earlier on, the increase of the consumer price index remained mild. Netting out the effect of the government's one-off measures, the underlying inflation rate was 0.6% for last year as a whole, down 0.7 percentage point from the year before. Dampened by factors including the monetary policy stance in the US, the regulatory requirements in the mainland, and the emergence of COVID-19's variants and supply bottlenecks worldwide, the local stock market underwent a sharp adjustment in 2021. As supported by the low interest rate environment and firm end user demand, the residential property market was active in the first half of last year. Although the market sentiment weakened in the fourth quarter of last year due to local stock market adjustment and concerns about the US interest rate hikes, flat prices still saw a moderate increase of 3% for the whole year. As for the non-residential property market, with the recovery of the local economy, coupled with the abolition of the double stamp duty imposed on non-residential property transactions in November 2020, there was a visible rebound in transaction activities last year. Yet prices and rentals of office space were relatively soft, while those of industrial buildings rebounded significantly. The government will continue to spare no efforts in increasing land supply and closely monitor the property market development. Economic Outlook for 2022 and Medium Term Outlook The market generally expects a further revival of the, of the global economy this year, but the rampant Omicron variant has slowed the pace of global economic recovery recently. As affected by the impacts of high energy prices and supply bottlenecks, global inflation has been pushed up significantly, and many central banks will have to tighten their monetary policies. Besides, the geopolitical situation is complex and volatile. All these factors have cast uncertainties over the global economic outlook. Last month, the IMF lowered its global economic growth forecast for the year to 4.4%. In the mainland, the epidemic was contained effectively last year. Production activities have revived and the external trade has put up a strong performance. Last year, the growth rate of the mainland economy was 8.1%, which was faster than that of most economies. Looking ahead, although the mainland economy is facing some downward pressure, its sound fundamentals along with ample policy room will support the steady economic growth in the mainland and will continue to be the growth engine of the global economy. Last year, the US economy rebounded visibly. The market generally predicts that it will see further growth this year, however, in response to rising inflation, the Federal Reserve Board will likely raise interest rates several times and start to reduce the size of its balance sheet progressively within the year. Besides, fiscal policy support is expected to reduce from last year. These may affect the momentum of economic growth. The Eurozone economy slowed again in the latter part of last year due to the resurgence of the pandemic. However, with the still accommodative monetary policy and supportive fiscal measures, it will likely continue to recover this year. The economic growth outlook for Japan and other Asian economies this year will hinge on the pandemic developments and the restrictive measures imposed by their respective governments. Although further recovery of the global economy will lend support to Hong Kong's further export performance this year, our economy and people's livelihood have been under immense pressure in recent months as the rapid worsening of the fifth wave of the epidemic coupled with further tightening of various restrictive measures, led to drastic fall in people flow and seriously dampened consumer and economic sentiments. To win this fight against the pandemic, the government will devote all out efforts in stepping up testing and anti-epidemic work. Inevitably, economic activities, particularly the consumption related sectors will continue to be under intense pressure in the short term. Unemployment and underemployment situation will also deteriorate the economic performance in the first quarter is not optimistic. The successful control of the 
of the epidemic is a key to safeguarding our economy and people's livelihood. With the staunch support and unfailing assistance from our country, the government and the whole community must join hands to fight the virus and win the battle promptly. As long as the recent wave of the, the epidemic can be gradually put under control and the status of dynamic zero infection can be maintained down the road, consumption and investment demand will likely get a steam again. A stabilized epidemic situation will also create favorable conditions for the gradual and orderly resumption of quarantine-free travel between the mainland and Hong Kong, thereby injecting greater impetus into the economy. Having regard to the latest local and external situations, as well as the stimulus effect of the fiscal measures, I forecast that Hong Kong's economy will put up a better performance in the second half of this year and achieve growth of 2 to 3.5% in real terms for the year as a whole. On inflation, external price pressures are expected to remain high and persist for some time, while domestic cost pressures will also increase gradually alongside the economic recovery. On the other hand, the upward pressure on the residential rentals remain mild. Taking all factors into account, I forecast that the headline inflation rate and the underlying inflation rate will be 2.1% and 2% respectively this year. Although inflation pressure in Hong Kong remains moderate in overall terms, given that the supply of, main, of many daily necessities relies on imports, we should keep in view the impacts brought by external inflation on people's livelihood if such inflation leads to an increase in the prices of, ex, of imported goods. In the medium term, the economic outlook for Hong Kong is positive. The sustained high quality development of our country's economy will serve as the key driver of global economic growth and provide the most solid foundation for Hong Kong to prosper and develop. The 14th five-year plan establishes a clear positioning and direction for Hong Kong's economic development and supports Hong Kong for the development of the eight international centers and emerging industries. We may, by leveraging our advantages under one country, two systems, achieve coordinated development with our neighboring cities in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, thereby creating enormous business opportunities and ample room for Hong Kong's development. Besides, the government has been committed to nurturing emerging industries over the past few years. Among them, the ecosystem of the innovation and technology industry has become increasingly mature and is ready to contribute more to Hong Kong's economy and competitiveness in the coming years. Regarding our traditional industries, financial services have been developing rapidly with a promising outlook and will remain a driving force for our economic growth in the future. To make the best use of the opportunities, we must continue to build capacity and overcome the constraints on our workforce and land supply and make concerted efforts to scale new heights in our economic development. Considering all these factors and taking into account the catch-up growth after the epidemic, I forecast that Hong Kong's economy will grow by an average of 3% per annum in real terms from 2023 to 26, slightly higher than the trend growth of 2.8% during the decade before the pandemic. The underlying inflation rate is forecast to average 2.5%. Fighting the virus together. The COVID-19 epidemic starting from early 2020 has affected people's livelihood and the economy. In response to this, the government promptly set up the anti-epidemic fund to provide appropriate financial assistance for the affected individuals and businesses. I'm deeply grateful to the Finance Committee of the Legislative Council for promptly approving a further injection of $27 billion into the AEF last Tuesday so that the sixth round of measures can be introduced under the AEF. These include providing support for the first time for the temporarily unemployed with $3 billion earmarked for granting a subsidy of $10,000 to each of, to each eligible person. I believe that the latest round of relief measures can help the public meet their imminent needs. Counter-cyclical measures were also launched in my previous two budgets. These measures, together with the relief measures under the AEF, AEF, involve a total financial commitment of over $460 billion. Mm -hmm. Besides, government departments have also devoted substantial resources to fight the, the epidemic, including providing isolation facilities at Penny's Bay and other appropriate locations, setting up a temporary hospital at the Asia World Expo, launching the vaccination program, providing testing services, and increasing the supply of medications, medical equipment, etc., involving a total of over $24 billion. Fighting the epidemic is our overriding mission at present. The government will mobilize all available manpower and resources to contain and stabilize the epidemic. I will once again allocate substantial additional resources in the new financial year, including 
an additional funding of about $22 billion for the Food and Health Bureau to strengthen testing work, procure rapid antigen test kits and relevant services, and provide additional support for the hospital authority. B, an additional funding of $6 billion for the Department of Health to procure more vaccines as booster doses for the general public. C, an additional funding amounting to about $7 billion in total for relevant departments to procure anti-epidemic items and services, implement anti-epidemic measures, etc. D, a total additional funding of $500 million to be allocated within two years for the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department to enhance environmental hygiene services, particularly strengthening the street cleansing and refuse collection services, stepping up measures on rodent control and improving the hygiene of public markets in response to the, the epidemic. Meanwhile, the FEHD will strengthen inspections and enforcement action to raise the community's awareness about hygiene. And E, a further injection of 12 billion dollars into the AEF for the construction of various anti-epidemic related facilities. Besides, I have earmarked 20 billion dollars for other potential anti-epidemic needs. We will provide full support to fight the, the epidemic should more resources be required. Relieving people's hardship. To provide support for members of the public who have been affected by the epidemic, I will introduce the following one-off measures. A, reducing salaries, tax, and tax under personal assessment for the year of assessment 2021-22 by 100%, subject to a ceiling of $10,000. The reduction will be reflected in the final tax payable for the year of assessment 2021-22. to This measure will benefit 2.01 million taxpayers and reduce government revenue by 13.1 billion. B, providing rates concession for domestic properties for four quarters of 2022-23, to subject to a ceiling of 1.5 thousand per quarter in the first two quarters and a ceiling of one thousand dollars per quarter in the remaining two quarters for each rateable property this measure is estimated to involve 2.99 million domestic properties and reduce government revenue by 11.7 billion dollars c granting each eligible residential electricity account a subsidy of one thousand dollars this measure will involve an expenditure of about 2.8 billion dollars and benefit about 2.8 million residential households. D, providing an allowance to eligible social security recipients equal to one half of a month of the standard rate comprehensive social security assistance payments, old age allowance, old age living allowance, or disability allowance. This measure will involve additional expenditure of, of about $2.384 billion. Similar arrangements will apply to recipients of the family work of, of the working family allowance involving additional expansion of about 117 million paying exemption fees for school candidates sitting for the 2023 Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education and Examination, incurring $149 million. We will also lower the threshold for the public transport fare subsidy scheme $400 to $200 from May to October this year. The government will provide commuters with a subsidy amounting to one-third of the actual monthly public transport expenses in excess of $200 subject to a maximum of $500 per month. With an increase of $1.08 billion in the subsidy amount, it's estimated that the scheme will benefit about 3.8 million commuters per month. Moreover, I propose to provide a tax deduction for domestic rental expenses starting from the year of assessment 2022 to 23, so as to ease the burden of renting a private property on taxpayers li liable to salaries tax and tax under personal assessment who are not owners of domestic properties subject to a deduction ceiling of $100,000 for a year of assessment. It's expected that government revenue will be reduced by $3.3 billion. We plan to introduce a bill into the LegCo for scrutiny in the second quarter of this year. The 100% personal loan guarantee scheme rolled out last year has helped a lot of people. I will extend the scheme for one year until the end of April next year. The maximum loan amount per, per applicant will increase from six times to nine times of his or her average monthly income during employment, and the ceiling will increase from $80,000 to $100,000. In addition, the maximum repayment period under the scheme will be extended from six years to 10 years, whereas the maximum duration of principal moratorium will be extended from 12 months to 18 months. 
the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the lending institutions will also enhance the flexibility of the scheme to assist those with income substantially reduced under the epidemic. To strengthen support for e-learning, the Quality Education Fund has set aside $2 billion to launch a three-year program starting from this school year, under which subsidies will be provided to schools who purchase mobile computer devices and portable Wi-Fi devices for loan to needy students. This initiative will facilitate the learning of students from grassroots families during the epidemic. Supporting enterprises. During this critical juncture of fighting the epidemic, we must take all necessary measures to preserve the vitality of the economy, in particular, the survival of SMEs and strive to safeguard jobs. I will take measures to ease the operating pressure of businesses and enhance the cash flow support for them. For easing the operating pressure of businesses, I propose a reducing profits tax for the year of assessment 2021 to 22 by 100% subject to a ceiling of $10,000. The reduction will be reflected in the final tax payable for the year of assessment 2021 to 22. This measure will benefit 151 thousand businesses and reduce government revenue by 1.2 billion. B, providing rates concession for non-domestic properties for four quarters of 2022 to 23, subject to a ceiling of $5,000 per quarter in the first two quarters and a ceiling of $2,000 per quarter in the remaining two quarters for each rateable property. This measure is, is estimated to involve 430,000 non-domestic properties and reduce government revenue by 3.4 billion. C, Waiving the business registration fees for 2022 to 23, this measure will benefit 1.5 million business operators and reduce government revenue by $3 billion. D, continuing to waive 75% of wattage and water and sewage charges payable by non-domestic households for eight months until the 30th of November 2022, subject to a monthly ceiling of $20,000 and $12,500 respectively per household. This measure will benefit 250 thousand non-domestic households and reduce government revenue by $680 million. E, extending the waivers or concessions of the existing 34 groups of government fees and charges for, for 12 months starting from October. This measure will benefit a wide range of sectors such as aviation, maritime, logistics, retail, catering, agriculture and fisheries, construction, tourism and entertainment and will reduce government revenue by about $1.7 billion. And F, continuing to grant the 75% rental or fee concession currently applicable to eligible tenants of government and eligible short-term tenancies and waivers under the Lands Department for six months until the 30th of September. During the period, tenants who have to close their properties at the request of the government will continue to receive full rental waiver for the duration of the closure. This will reduce government revenue by $1.4 billion. As regards enhancing the cash flow support for businesses, I will extend the application period of all guaranteed products under the SME financing guarantee scheme for one year to the end of June next year. The special 100% loans guarantee under the SFGS will also be further enhanced by increasing the maximum loan amount per enterprise from the total amount of employee wages and rents for 18 months to that for 27 months with the loan ceiling raised from $6 million to $9 million and by extending the maximum repayment period from eight years to 10 years. Besides, I have requested the HMA to extend the pre-approved principal payment holiday scheme through the banking sector SME lending coordination mechanism for six months to the end of October. At the same time, the HMA and the banking sector will offer enterprises the option of making partial repayment of principal over a longer period of time. This arrangement will also apply to the loans granted under the SFGS. To help small and medium-sized exporters secure export financing from banks more easily, the Hong Kong Export Credit Corporation launched the Export Credit Guarantee Program on a pilot basis in March under which the ECIC will guarantee up to 70% of the export financing of their policyholders subject to a maximum limit of $50 million. 
In addition, to encourage exporters to take larger orders from overseas buyers, the ECIC will introduce the flexible indemnity ratio arrangement in the second half of the year to enhance insurance coverage for exporters. This measure is expected to benefit about 2.4 thousand policy holders, job creation, to ease the un unemployment situation due to the epidemic and the anti-epidemic measures, the government has earmarked total funding of 13.2 billion under the AF AEF to create time-limited jobs in the public and private sectors. As at end 2021, some 60,000 jobs were created under the two rounds of the job creation scheme, of which about 45,000 jobs were filled. We have earmarked an additional funding of $6.6 .6 billion in the latest round of AEF injection for the creation of another 30,000 time-limited jobs. Issuing consumption vouchers. Last year, we implemented the consumption voucher scheme for the first time. With the help and concerted efforts of various parties, the scheme was effective in boosting the market sentiment, stimulating local consumption, and speeding up economic recovery. It has also promoted the extensive use of electronic payment. The new wave of epidemic has disrupted the pace of economic recovery. With last year's experience, I will implement a new round of consumption voucher scheme under which electronic consumption vouchers with a total value of $10,000 will be dispersed by instrument to each eligible Hong Kong permanent resident and new arrival age 18 or above through suitable stored value facilities. The scheme is expected to benefit about 6.6 .6 million people. I fully understand that this wave of epidemic has seriously affected various sectors and the public. In order to relieve the burden of the people and different merchants, I will make a special arrangement under which consumption vouchers valued at $5,000 will be dispersed in April to over 6.3 million successful registrants first by making use of the registration data collected through last year's consumption voucher scheme. They will get the remaining vouchers by instruments together with the new eligible persons in the middle of the year. In this regard, the government will, in moving the vote on account resolution, inform the LECO that the funding allocation for the consumption voucher scheme may be used upon passage of the resolution. I hope that the scheme will inject impetus to the market when the epidemic is stabilized so as to accelerate economic recovery and further encourage the public and merchants to use electronic payment, which will promote the development of digital economy. The entire scheme will incur about $66.4 billion of financial commitment. We will announce the details as soon as possible. Enhancing economic resilience and enriching industrial development. When formulating long-term economic policies, first we must be clear about the purpose of economic development so that policy implementation will not deviate from its original intention. It's also necessary to have a full understanding of our country's development plans and strategies, as well as Hong Kong's roles and functions therein, and to take into account demand in the international market in order to identify the right positioning and seize opportunities. Furthermore, we need to keep carefully assessing the international political economic landscapes, clearly identify long-term trends, graphs, economic patterns, and prudently control risks to avoid disruptions to development. people-centric development. First of all, it is, is, it is necessary to know whom and what purpose economic development is for. Hong Kong's per capita GDP reached 49,000 US dollars last year, and the latest seasonally adjusted unemployment rate has fallen to 3.9%, which look good. However, these figures do not allow us to see clearly many issues such as unbalanced economic development, and that many young people cannot fulfill their aspirations. For example, financial services accounted for 23% of GDP in 2020. This reflects that although people in history have high incomes, the beneficiaries are not broad enough. In fact, unemployment earnings of youth in the younger generation with post-entry education are generally significantly lower than those of the older generation with similar educational attainment, indicated, indicating that the pace of economic upgrading falls short of creating sufficient 
high quality jobs for young people. Economic development is meant to raise the living standards of all citizens and to let all of us share the fruits of development. This is also the foundation of social harmony. As such, we must enrich industrial development and move towards high quality and inclusive economic growth, thereby creating more high quality and diverse employment opportunities. This will not only benefit the citizens better, but also create conditions and provide resources to solve deep-seated problems such as housing and poverty. A new starting point in history. The implementation of the Hong Kong national security law coupled with the improvement of the electoral system is to implement the fundamental principle of patriots administering Hong Kong and establish Hong Kong's political order from a legal and institutional perspective. And as, as a result, the practice of one country, two systems in Hong Kong can be brought back to the right track for steadfast and successful implementation so that Hong Kong can consolidate and strengthen its uniqueness and advantages under the system. At present, the executive-led political system has been strengthened and there is healthy interaction between the executive and the legislature. The administration's governance efficiency has been enhanced as a result. The Hong Kong SAL government, the LegCo, and all sectors of society can work together to address social, economic, and people's livelihood issues and gradually resolve some of the deep-seated contradictions that have hindered Hong Kong's development for a long time. Year 2022 marks the 25th anniversary of the reunification of the Hong Kong SAR with our motherland, which will mark a new historical starting point for Hong Kong and new milestone towards governance and prosperity. Integrate into the national development. Hong Kong has unique advantages, including institutional advantages under one country, two systems, the fine tradition of rule of law, and the market-oriented and internationalized business environment. We have always been leveraging the support from our motherland while engaging with the world, serving our country's needs with our strengths and achieving great development in return. Under the 14-5 year plan, our country continues to reform and open up, moves towards high quality development and progress according to the strategy of domestic and international dual circulation. It also makes clear the position and direction of Hong Kong's economic development and supports the development of Hong Kong in eight areas. Integrating into the national development is an inevitable path for the Hong Kong economy. The government will, will make good use of national policies and our own advantages and take the GBA as an entry point, proactively exploring the vast mainland market and participating in the domestic circulation of the national economy. At the same time, Hong Kong will play its bridging and platform role at the intersection of domestic and international circulations while connecting domestic and foreign markets and investors and assisting mainland enterprises to explore the international market, seeking progress while maintaining stability. The world is undergoing a change unseen in a century. In recent years, Western countries have been trying to suppress our country's development. The COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a severe blow to the global supply chains, further heightening protectionism. In the past two years, governments of many countries have raised debts of massive scale, and central banks have implemented extremely accommodative monetary policies greatly increasing macroeconomic and financial market vulnerabilities. We need to stay highly vigilant at all times, better connect with the, the international market under the premise that risks are well managed, thereby striving for progress while maintaining stability. We also have to use development to enhance our ability to cope with risks so as to promote stability with progress. Innovation and technology as well as digital economy. Innovation and technology development of clean economies. The INT industry is not only a new economic growth spot, but can also enhance the productivity of other industries. For Hong Kong, whether it is the development of new industries with advantages or the transformation and upgrading of traditional industries, the contribution of INT is required. Therefore, we must focus on promoting INT development. Digitalization is an inevitable trend as the economy moves towards high quality development. Through the collection of various data in the economic system, followed by digitalization, organization and analysis of these data, we can better understand the operation of the entire economy and the individual segments and enhance efficiency and promote innovation. For enterprises, digitalization can help on transformation and empowerment, quality and quantity improvement and innovation stimulation. In order to accelerate the progress of the digital economy, I will set up a digital economy 
Development Committee with members comprising experts and scholars, industry elites, and relevant government officials. Next, I will elaborate on the key points of injecting new fields and elements into Hong Kong's economic development. Innovation and technology developments. Continuous promotion of INT developments is an important strategy to foster a more vibrant and diversified economy. The 14 five year plan supports Hong Kong's developments into an international INT hub. Apart from fostering economic growth and job creation, INT developments can also promote reindustrialization and enhance the competitiveness of our manufacturing sector, as well as, an, as, well as enable digital transformation across various trades. The current time government has invested over $130 billion in INT development, which has seen results trending up gradually in recent years. I will allocate additional resources in the budget to keep reinforcing the entire value chain and the INT ecosystem. Support startups and technology investments. The INT ecosystem in Hong Kong has become increasingly vibrant. The number of startups surged from around 1,000 in 2014 to around 4,000 last year. And the amount of venture capital investment surged from $1.24 billion to about $41.7 billion in the same period. Currently, Hong Kong is Asia's largest and the world's second largest fundraising hub for biotechnology. In recent years, the governments and local universities have allocated considerable resources to nurture startups and assist research teams comprising students and in research and results. Hong Kong Science and Technology our two IND flagships provide one-stop support services for startups. So far, we have witnessed the birth and development of over 10 unicorns. Over the past few years, apart from the $2 billion Innovation and Technology Venture Fund, we have also set up the Corporate Venture Fund and the Cyberport Macro Fund through the HKSTPC and the Cyberport, respectively. Each of these funds has its own specific key areas of investment, which has significantly broadened the fundraising channel for startups in Hong Kong. Nevertheless, as the funds mentioned above are mainly targeted at early stage startups, they may not be suitable for expanding enterprises with considerable scale. Some such type of enterprises often have huge development potential. Indeed, we are not short of examples of success in nurturing these enterprises in Hong Kong. I announced in my budget two years ago the setting up of an investment portfolio named the Hong Kong Growth Portfolio, using parts of the Future Fund for investments in projects with a Hong Kong nexus. The aim is to consolidate Hong Kong's status as a financial, commercial, and INT center, as well as to raise our productivity and competitiveness in the long run. Last year, the government appointed eight fund managers as general partners to make strategic investments. To nurture enterprises that are relatively more mature and have good potential for contribution to our economy, I will further increase the funding allocated to the Hong Kong Growth Portfolio under the Future Fund by $10 billion, of which $5 billion will be used to set up a new investment fund, namely the Strategic Tech Fund. I will invite the HA support to technology enterprises with which are of strategic value to Hong Kong, as well as investment opportunities conducive to enriching, to enriching the INT ecosystem. On the other hand, the Technology Startup Support Scheme for Universities under the Innovation and Technology Fund has been supporting universities in setting up their own startups and commercializing their R&D results with a view to creating economic value. To help universities realize their R&D outcomes, I will double the amount of subsidy to $16 million. The increased subsidy will be provided to startups, startups of universities with private investments on a matching basis of one-to-one. -one. Each startup may receive an annual subsidy of up to $1.5 million for a maximum of three years. The initiative will incur an additional expenditure of $48 million per year promotes life and health scientific research. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic for more than two years has, has roused much global interest in R&D in life and health disciplines. 
In fact, the national 14-5 year plan has also called for focusing on issues like human health, as well as the enhancements of technology, technological streams in specialist fields such as life and health. Hong Kong has strong research capabilities in life and health sciences. There are a number of renowned scholars in local universities whose R&D teams display great originality and have the ability to create breakthroughs out of the blue, generating fruitful outcomes in scientific research. With clinical trial centers recognized by the National Medical Products Administration, Hong Kong enjoys clear advantages in promoting research and fostering developments of industries in life and health disciplines. In year 2018, I allocated $10 billion to launch the flagship project of Inno Hong Kong Research Clusters, under which 28 laboratories have so far been established by local universities in collaboration with over 30 top-notch universities or research institutions around the world. Among these laboratories, 16 are related to life and health sciences. On the back of our robust strength in scientific research, we can deliver more revolutionary R&D outcomes. To further promote the development of life and health technology in Hong Kong, I will earmark $10 billion to provide more comprehensive support in the long run, including hardware, research talents, clinical trials, and data application, with the aim of enabling institutions, including universities, to enhance their capacity and capability in this area, as well as strengthening the industrial chain. We will set up the InnoLife Health Tech Hub in the Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovation and Technology Park. With the above 16 laboratories and the eight relevant state key laboratories as the basis, we can pull together top-notch research teams from all over the world and focus our efforts on R&D work, as well as global research collaboration in the field of life and health sciences. This includes biomedicine, big data, and artificial intelligence, which can be applied in various areas, such as prevention, diagnosis, drug discovery, advanced treatments, and rehabilitation. The EHA will assist more institutions in exploring how to make better use of their hospitals for conducting research and clinical trials, as well as the valuable clinical data they have accumulated for R&D purposes. Our aim is to promote multi-faceted collaboration in scientific research and development of industries, develop Hong Kong into a major R&D hub in life, life and health disciplines, and link up related industrial clusters. Promote research and development. We have been actively promoting R&D in the past few years. There are 16 state key laboratories and six Hong Kong branches of Chinese National Engineering Research Centers in Hong Kong. They all possess high level scientific research teams and equipment, and many of them enjoy global leading positions in their areas of expertise. Currently, these institutions are receiving an annual subsidy under the ITF. I announced that the amount of subsidy be doubled to $440 million so that they can have more resources to conduct R&D activities, nurture local talents as well as attract more local and overseas R&D talents, and further the cooperation and exchanges with institutions in the mainland. Technology application. We have been encouraging the public and private sectors to proactively apply technologies in their operations for the benefits and convenience of the public. To promote further digitalization in government operations, I have reserved $600 million to conduct a comprehensive e-government audit in the coming three years with the aim of reviewing the progress made by government departments in using technologies, as well as assisting them in enhancing the efficiency of public service provision through the adoption of INT solutions. Strengthening intellectual property regime. Intellectual property or IP protection is in line with the direction of developing Hong Kong into a knowledge-based economy and an international INT hub. The government will strengthen the IP regime in Hong Kong. With regard to patents, we we will further promote and develop Hong Kong's original grant patent or OGP system. In the next three financial years, I will allocate a total of about $85 million to the Intellectual Property Department, or IPD, for enhancing Hong Kong's capacity to conduct substantive, substantive examination in processing OGP applications. On trademarks, we are pressing ahead with the prep, prep, preparatory work for implementing the protocol relating to Madrid agreements concerning the international registration of marks in Hong Kong. 
It is expected that an international trademark registration system will be put in place in Hong Kong next year as the earliest. As for copyrights, to tie in with the development of digital environments, the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau launched a public consultation exercise on updating Hong Kong's copyright regime at the end of last year. The consultation period ends today. The government will carefully consider the views collected before introducing a bill to amend the copyright ordinance into the electrical in the first half of this year. The IPD will also actively explore with the mainland authorities facilitation measures for cross-boundary IP protection, enhance its free IP consultation service, IP manager scheme, plus, and other training programs, and collaborate with the Department of Justice to promote IP mediation and arbitration services. Besides, we will work with the Hong Kong Trade Development Council and relevant stakeholders to promote Hong Kong's IP professional services through different channels. International Financial Center. The development of Hong Kong as an international financial center has dovetailed with the needs of our country and attuned to the powers of the global investment part of the South Solomon pool of capital, investors, entrepreneurs, and professional services talent was created in Hong Kong. A market size continues to grow with new services and products rolling out one after another. Following the continuous expansion and enhancements of the mutual access regime and our implementation of various policies to promote the transformation of the market structure in recent years, Hong Kong's role and function as the international financial center of our country have been further enhanced. Hong Kong has risen to a new level of development with a wider scope of services and a more comprehensive industrial chain. The clustering effect in respect of financial institutions has also become more prominent. The 14 five-year plan expressly supports Hong Kong in enhancing our status as an international financial center, strengthening its function as a, as a global offshore R&B business hub, an international assets management center, and a risk management center, as well as deepening and widening mutual assets between the financial markets of Hong Kong and the mainland so as to develop a high-quality GBA. We will endeavor to achieve the goal of enhancing the capability of the financial sector in serving the real economy. While making rapid developments, we need to strike a balance to maintain stability and security, enabling Hong Kong to fully realize its market potential, as well as achieving rapid, long-term, and steady market developments. The steady developments of our country provides the most solid backing for Hong Kong. Under the due circulation strategy, our country's continuous reform, high-quality two-way opening up, ongoing RMB internationalization, and transformation to a green and zero em emission financial secretary, RMB internationalization and transformation into a green and zero emission economy have brought us new emissions and opportunities. Hong Kong has to proactively develop a more vibrant and diversified financial market in terms of type of investment products, risk management to appropriate corporate financing, arrangement, treasury management needs, etc. By doing so, we can definitely ensure a stronger development of our financial markets through which we can deepen and widen the mutual assets between mainland and international capital markets, thereby facilitating Hong Kong's development into a more competitive and powerful international financial center. Securities market. In the past year, the securities market continued to flourish. The Hong Kong stock market recorded an average daily turnover of $166.7 billion last year, representing an increase of 29% over year 2020. Funds raised through initial public offerings or IPO in Hong Kong amounted to nearly $330 billion during the same period, making Hong Kong the fourth largest IPO center in the world. Hong Kong remains the main listing platform worldwide. The increase in trading and market capitalization of Hong Kong stocks was attributable mainly to the series of reform implemented in the past few years to enhance the competitiveness of the Hong Kong market, including allowing emerging and innovative enterprises with weighted voting rights structure, as well as pre-revenue or pre-profits biotechnology companies to list in Hong Kong and providing facilitation for qualifying issuers to seek secondary listing in Hong Kong. As at the end of last month, a total of 70 companies have listed in Hong Kong under the new regime, raising more than $570 billion, representing nearly half of the total funds raised during the same period. Currently, the new economy enterprises amount for more than 20% of the total market capitalization in Hong Kong. Among them, 48 are healthcare and biotechnology companies. They have raised over $110 billion in total, turning Hong Kong into Asia's largest and the world's second largest fundraising hub for biotechnology and spurring the rapid and comprehensive developments of the biotechnology ecosystem in Hong Kong. 
continuous operational enhancement, system reform, reforma reformation, reformation, and innovative development are important means to empower and accelerate the development of Hong Kong markets. In January this year, after striking a balance amongst considerations such as need to ensure the quality of listed companies, investor protection, and market developments, the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, or HKEX, launched a listing regime for special purpose acquisition companies, or SPAC, enabling experienced and re re uh, reputable spec promoters to source new and innovative enterprises for merger and acquisition with a view to assisting emerging enterprises with potential in listing through an unconventional initial offering and providing a new alternative listing route in Hong Kong. Moreover, with the continuous development of the mainland economy, enterprises have substantial financing, financing needs in the international markets. However, due to the increased risk and uncertainties of listing in overseas markets, many China concept stock companies have chosen to return. We have already made preparation for their return, including allowing greater China companies without weighted voting rights structure and which are not from innovative sectors to seek secondary listing in Hong Kong and offering more flexibility to issuers seeking dual primary listings. These measures will help further attract quality China concepts stock companies to list in Hong Kong and provide more choices for market players, thereby increasing market liquidity and enhancing the competitiveness of Hong Kong as a global fin financing platform. On market development, considering the fact that there are some large-scale advanced technology enterprises which require substantial capital for the R&D work, but are not qualified for listing as they fail to meet the profits and trading record requirements, the Securities and Futures Commission, or the SFC, and the HKEX are reviewing the main board listing rules and having due regard to the risk involved, examining the revision of the listing requirements to meet the fundraising needs of such enterprises. Bond markets. Bond markets not only facilitate medium and long-term capital allocation and management, but, but also guide capital markets with greater depth and breadth towards the role of supporting a real economy. Developing the bond markets in Hong Kong has been one of our key objectives in recent years. Apart from promoting the diversi diversification of bond products, we strive to move towards the development direction of financial inclusion, enabling the public to participate and benefit from such inclusion. The Steering Committee on Bond Markets Development in Hong Kong, which was set up under my steer last year, has reviewed the current situation of the bond market in Hong Kong and put forward recommendations along three directions. They include enhancing market landscape, market infrastructure, and market promotion to further promote the development of our bond markets. We will progressively implement these recommendations, including expanding the issuance of green bonds, RMB bonds, and Hong Kong dollar bonds on the government's bond programs to foster developments of local RMB and green bond markets, the formation of local yield curve, consolidating our strengths in promoting offshore RMB business, and encouraging participation of mainland enterprises and entities in Hong Kong's bond markets, and stepping up efforts to promote Hong Kong's position as a bond center among investors and bond issuers. Meanwhile, we will further enhance the functions of the central money markets unit by upgrading it to be a major central securities depository platform in Asia, while working on the development of an electronic bond trading platform to facilitate secondary transactions and expand investor base. Besides, we will also explore ways to enhance the prospectus requirements and on the premise of ensuring due protection of investors, make it easier for retail investors to participate in and share the fruits of our bond market development. We have been committed to promoting the development of retail bonds so as to benefit the public. I plan to issue no less than $15 billion of inflation-linked retail bonds, that is I-bond, and no less than $35 billion of silver bond in the next financial year, with a view to offering members of the public, particularly the elderly, investment options with steady returns. Details of the first batch of retail green bonds for public subscription were announced last week. Members of the public can directly invest in green projects that provide environmental benefits so as to jointly create a green environment for green living in Hong Kong while gaining steady inflation-linked returns. 
a plan to continue to issue no less than $10 billion of retail green bonds in the next financial year. Offshore RMB Business Hub. Hong Kong's offshore RMB market is the largest in scale. With our geographical and cultural edges, as well as first mover advantage, Hong Kong has been financial secretary. Financial secretary, please uh, pause. FS, it seems that the connection is glitchy. Let's wait for the technicians to sort it out. Ms. Maggie Chan, uh, you have raised your hand. Is there a point of order? My apologies, uh, I pressed the wrong button, President. I will lower my hand. The meeting will um, suspend for 15 minutes for uh, the technicians to address the problem.
Financial Secretary, please continue. Thank you, President. Members and members of the public, my apologies. I will now continue. Offshore RMB Business Hub. Hong Kong's offshore RMB market is the largest in scale. With our geographical and cultural edges, as well as first mover advantage, Hong Kong has been performing the role of facilitator and innovator in proactively promoting the inter internationalization of RMB in terms of offshore RMB capital flow, clearing volume, products type, and risk management tool. In the future, we will explore ways to further expand the channels for the two-way flow of cross-boundary RMB funds, as well as continue to promote the development of offshore RMB products, including introducing more diversified RMB wealth management products and bonds. The working group formed by the SFC, the HKEX, and the HAMA has completed the feasibility study on allowing stocks traded via the southbound trading of Stock Connect to be de denominated in RMB and put forth recommendations on detailed implementation. The working group will start making preparation in this regard and will discuss with the regulatory authorities and relevant organizations in the mainland. The government will roll out supporting measures such as waiving the stamp duty on stock transfers paid by market makers in market makers in their transactions so as to increase the liquidity of RMB denominated stocks. We are also working with the regulatory authorities in the mainland to explore enhancement measures for the cross-boundary wealth management connect scheme in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, GBA, such as, such as increasing quotas gradually, expanding the scope of eligible investment products, inviting more participating organizations, and improving the distribution arrangements. Deepen mutual access with the mainland. Mutual access between the financial markets in the mainland and Hong Kong has been deepening and widening. Last September saw the launch of the southbound trading of Bond Connect and the cross-boundary wealth management connect scheme in the GBA. The Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect and the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect have continued to expand, registering a substantial increase in trading volume. At the end of last year, a consensus was reached among the exchanges in the two places on the inclusion of exchange-traded funds or ETFs in the mutual market access program. The mutual access of ETFs is expected to be implemented soon. As a risk management tool, the Asia Index Futures contract was also successfully launched last year. We will explore more risk management products. Development of family office business. In my last budget, I proposed to review the relevant tax arrangements with the aim of further attracting family offices to establish a presence in Hong Kong. After discussing and examining the relevant arrangements with the assets management sector, we propose to provide tax concessions for the eligible family investment management entities managed by single family offices. We will consult the sector on the detailed proposal as soon as possible and aim to submit legislative amendments to the legal within the current legislative session. It is expected that the relevant tax concessions will come into effect in the year of assessments 2022 and 23. I believe that the proposal will enhance our attractiveness as a hub for family offices, deepen Hong Kong's pool of liquidity, and create more business opportunities for the financial sector and other professional sectors. Green and Sustainable Finance The development of green and sustainable finance in Hong Kong offers promising prospects. By leveraging our advantages as an international financial center, we can facilitate matching between international capital and quality green projects, contribute proactively to helping our country achieve its 2000, uh, 2060 targets in relation to carbon emission peak and carbon neutrality, as well as propelling Hong Kong towards our carbon neutrality targets by year 2050 and promoting green transformation of our economy. Since the launch of our government's green bond program in year 2018, a total of more than US $7 billion equivalent of green bonds targeting global institutional investors has been successfully issued. Several important milestones have been achieved, including the issuance of a 30-year US dollar denominated green bond and a 20-year euro denominated green bond, and both of which are the first issuance among Asian governments, and have established an important reference benchmark for the thriving development of the bond markets in Hong Kong. Successful issuance of our but Shenzhen Municipal Hong Kong has set a leading example for the GBA cities to make good use of the Hong Kong markets for green financing. It has also further strengthened Hong Kong's functions as an offshore RMB hub and a green financial center. This year, we will continue to issue green bonds totaling about 4.5 billion US dollars or equivalent. 
The Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme launched last year has been well received by the industry. Over 50 applications have been approved so far, covering various kinds of green and sustainable debt instruments. Among the applications approved, many of them involved subsidies for covering the external review costs relating to green and sustainable loans. To support enterprises in obtaining green financing, we will lower the minimum loan size from $200 million to $100 million in respect of applications for subsidies for covering external review costs under the scheme. Infrastructure Financing Securitization to consolidate the vital role of Hong Kong as an infrastructure financing hub and a premier overseas financing platform under the National BNR Initiative, the Hong Kong Mortgage Corporation Limited, or HKMC, will conduct a study on the implementation of a pilot scheme on infrastructure financing securitization within this year. Under the scheme, the HKMC is expected to offer infrastructure financing securitization products with a total value of 450 million US dollars to investors in the institutional market in the next financial year. This will enable the local infrastructure financing markets to become more vibrant and diversified and also facilitate the inflow of market capital to high quality infrastructure projects. Financial technology. The HKMA and the People's Bank of China, or PBOC, signed a memorandum on understanding in October last year. Under the MOU, the two authorities agreed to develop a one-stop platform in the form of a network link-up to allow eligible financial institutions and technology firms to conduct pilot trials of cross-boundary financial technology or fintech projects concurrently in Hong Kong and the mainland. At present, more than 10 local banks have expressed interest in using the platform. The HAMA and the PBOC are implementing the operation details of the platform. The FinTech Proof of Concept subsidy scheme has received overwhelming response from the industry since its first launch last year. We will allocate a funding of $10 million for launching a new round of the scheme this year. The aim is to promote continuous innovation by encouraging the financial industry to conduct proof of concept projects on more, than, on more financial services and products. Besides, we propose to provide subsidies to research institutions under the new round of the scheme so that they can put forward solutions as to how to remove development bottlenecks faced by, faced by the fintech industry in Hong Kong. Commercial data interchange. The commercial data interchange of the CDI announced in last year's budget, which is targeted to be launched by the end of this year, is progressing well. A number of banks have successfully approved loans totaling over 900 million Hong Kong dollars to SMEs using various kinds of commercial data during the study and pilot, pilot launch stage, stages of the project. The HAMA will enrich the data-driven financial service ecosystem by exploring the introduction of more commercial data sources in order to expand the function of the CDI. Concurrently, the government will explore ways to enable the financial institutions with the authorization by the enterprises to obtain the enterprises data kept in government departments from various departments in a computer readable format. Priority will be accorded to data which facilitates the application for financial services by SMEs. GBA Investment Fund. As I mentioned earlier, I will increase the funding allocated to the Hong Kong Group portfolio under the future fund by tax will be used to set up the strategic tech fund. As for the remaining $5 billion, it will be used to set up a GBA investment fund, which will focus on investment opportunities in the GBA. With the country's support, the GBA will be one of the key drivers of future regional economic development, and the prospects will be promising. As the relationship between Hong Kong and other cities in the GBA becomes closer, investing in the development of various priority industries in the region will not only inject more dynamism to the development of the region, but also bring economic and social benefits to Hong Kong. Arts, culture, and tourism. Arts and culture, which depicts the spirit and values of a community, is where the soft power of a place lies. With a rich Chinese heritage, distinctive features of East and West, as well as extensive international connections, Hong Kong is uniquely positioned to tell the story of China and Hong Kong through the promotion of arts and cultural development and exchange. This can also tie in with Hong Kong's new positioning as an East Mean for international exchange under the 14 5 year plan. I will allocate additional resources to promote arts and culture. Hong Kong performing arts market. 
to promote the development of the arts and cultural sector, it is important for us to provide an international platform which will be conducive to the creation of a complete ecosystem for the industry. Our arts and cultural sector has gathered considerable strength in respect of which show arts, arts Basel, Hong Kong, and the Business of Design Week held annually are claimed internationally. In year 2020, Hong Kong ranked as the second largest art market in the world after only New York. To consolidate Hong Kong's role as an East meets West Center for International Arts and Cultural Exchange, I will allocate $42 million for organizing the first Hong Kong performing arts market within two years. The large-scale arts market, which is designed for the performing arts industry, will serve as an integrated platform for showcasing the works of top-notch performing artists and arts groups from the mainland, Hong Kong, and overseas. This will help bring the remarkable performing arts of the mainland and Hong Kong onto the world stage through activities such as exhibitions, forums, focused discussions, performances, and trading. The event will also facilitate exchanges between renowned overseas performing artists as well as arts groups and the counterparts in the mainland of Hong Kong. Arts technology. The integration of arts and technology has become a new trend. Apart from expanding the reach of arts and its form of presentation, such integration has also brought, brought new development opportunities for the relevant sectors, especially the youth. In year 2020, we set aside $100 million to promote the integration of arts and technology by providing support to arts groups and IND talents. To further facilitate arts technology development, I will allocate $30 million to implement an arts technology funding pilot scheme in the next financial year. With the aim of encouraging the nine major performing arts groups to apply arts technology to enrich their put an additional amount of $10 million into the Arts Capacity Development Funding Scheme in order to encourage small and medium-sized arts groups to further explore the use of arts technology under the scheme. In addition, the East, Cal East Kowloon Cultural Center is expected to be commissioned in phases next year. I will earmark $85 million each year to support its development into a major arts technology venue and incubator for the provision of structured training. I will also set aside $70 million to upgrade the facilities of the performing venues under the Leisure and Cultural Services Department with a view to enabling arts groups to further apply technology in their performances, thereby enhancing audience experience. Developments of tourism industry. As the developments of tourism industry and the promotion of East meets West arts and cultural exchange are closely related, strengthening support for the tourism industry can help achieve synergy. Over the past two years, the government has rolled out measures of more than 3 $8 billion to support the tourism industry. In addition to providing direct financial subsidy to the trade, it also encourages the trade to explore more local tour itineraries before resumption of cross-boundary tourism, and enhancing the support team facilities of tourist attractions and the tour guide services as well. In light of fierce regional competition, we will get well prepared by providing additional resources for the promotion of cultural, heritage, and green tourism projects with Hong Kong characteristics, enhancing tourism promotion and rolling out enticing promotional offers in a timely manner to attract tourists from outside Hong Kong. This will also help consolidate Hong Kong's position as a core demonstration zone for multi-destination tourism and an international tourism hub as specified in the outline development plan for the GBA and the culture and tourism development plan for the GBA. I will earmark $1.26 billion to support and develop the tourism industry, of which $600 million will be used to implement a three-year scheme entitled Cultural and Heritage Size Local Tour Incentive Scheme. The scheme aims at providing incentives for the industry to develop and launch tourism products with cultural and heritage elements, as well as supporting the operation of the Green Lifestyle Local Tour Incentive Scheme. Another sum of $60 million will be used to sponsor the training of tourism practitioners for three years with a view to further improving the professional standards and service quality of the industry. The remaining sum of $600 million in the earmark funding will be used for supporting the work of the Hong Kong Tourism Board to revive the tourism industry and implement the CTD plan. The Tourism Board will continue to launch the Holiday at Home campaign to support the industry. When cross-boundary travel gradually resumes, the HKTB will promote the Open House Hong Kong campaign in appropriate source markets with a view to attracting tourists to revisit Hong Kong. Last year, the HKTB completed a preliminary study 
and a consultation exercise on the positioning of Hong Kong's tourism in the long run. Depending on the circumstances of individual source markets, a new tourism brand promotion campaign will be launched around the world in phases in the coming year. The HATB will also allocate a sum of $100 million from its reserve to support the above work. Hong Kong. Aviation and maritime sectors. Hong Kong's airport and port facilities are among the best in the world. The 14th five-year plan expressly supports Hong Kong in developing high-value-added maritime services and states for the first time the support for enhancing Hong Kong's status as an international aviation hub. The government will continue to take forward the development of Hong Kong's aviation sector by leveraging the geographical advantage of the Hong Kong International Airport on Lantau Island to build an airport city with diversified industry makeup, international air cargo. To further provide quality and efficient cargo services for the GBA, the Airport Authority Hong Kong plans to develop sea air cargo transshipment between the HAIA and the rest of the GBA. The AA will set up an upstream HAIA logistic logistics park in Dongguan and an airside intermodal cargo handling facility at the HAIA. This will allow export cargo from the mainland to complete security screening in advance and then be transported seamlessly to Hong Kong. It will then be directly transshipped to all overseas destinations through Hong Kong's international aviation network without the need to undergo further security screening. Similarly, international cargo can also be imported into the mainland through the re reverse process. Since the end of 2021, the AA has progressively launched a sea air intermodal pilot scheme with the existing facilities at the HAIA for the purpose of testing and establishing the full operational procedures. Maritime and Port Sector The Hong Kong Maritime and Port Board has set up a dedicated task force to explore concrete proposals to promote the development of smart port, including further enhancing port efficiency and reducing cargo handling time and costs with the use of a digitalized system. Based on the findings of its study, the HAMPB has proposed to provide half-tax concession to attract more maritime enterprises to establish a presence in Hong Kong. The government plans to introduce the proposed legislative amendments to the LegCo in the first half of this year. Agriculture and Fisheries To encourage the upgrading and sustainable development of the agricultural and fisheries sector, we have launched two pilot schemes under the Sustainable Agricultural Development Fund and the Sustainable Fisheries Development Fund, respectively, to provide subsidies for the local agriculture and fisheries industry to adopt new technologies such as hydroponic technology, smart farm management, advanced livestock waste treatment technology, deep sea mariculture and shellfish and crustacean farming, etc., with a view to further promoting modernization of the industry in, and enhancing its competitiveness as well as fostering the transfer of knowledge. I propose making two separate injections of $500 million each into the SADF and the SFDF as well as expanding the coverage of the funds and streamlining the application procedures as appropriate. This will support the development of the industry in terms of application of advanced technology and intensification of production and help it seize the opportunities arising from the GBA development. We will continue to take forward the measures under the new agriculture policy, including the establishment of the agricultural park in Kutong South in the new territories. The agri-park phase one will provide about seven hectares of agricultural land that the works are expected to complete in phases from the second quarter of this year to 2023. As for phase two, the perpetual work has commenced and the project is expected to provide about 70 hectares of agricultural land. Stepping up investment promotion. Foreign investment is highly conducive to the development of various economic areas. Quality foreign investment brings in not only capital, but also skills and job opportunities. We must continue to attract mainland and overseas enterprises to make investment in Hong Kong to inject new impetus into our economic growth. Hong Kong's appeal to foreign investment is beyond question. According to a survey conducted by the government, the number of mainland and overseas companies in Hong Kong increased by 10% from 8,225 in 2017 to a record high of 9,049 last year, demonstrating that Hong Kong's business environment remains remarkable. Attract investment from the mainland and overseas. Competition among various economies in the aftermath of the pandemic will definitely intensify. We must step up our efforts in investment promotion to attract foreign enterprises to Hong Kong. Signed from the next financial year, the government will provide an additional recurrent provision of around $90 million in phases to strengthen and invest Hong Kong's work 
and our investment promotion network in the mainland and overseas. And President Hong Kong has signed 45 comprehensive avoidance of double taxation agreements and is in negotiations with 14 tax jurisdictions with a view to minimizing the risk of double taxation borne by foreign enterprises doing business in Hong Kong. We will continue to proactively expand our CDTA network, Global Financial Leaders Investment Summit. To further tap into Hong Kong's strength in attracting investment and our influence as an international financial center, I have invited the HMA to organize a high-level investment summit. Representatives of mainland and international financial institutions will be invited to attend the summit to learn about the unique advantages and investment environment of Hong Kong and to jointly explore global financial opportunities and the role that Hong Kong can play in the future. Trade development. Hong Kong has all along been a highly open trade center. The 14 5 year plan supports Hong Kong in enhancing its status as an international trade center. The Hong Kong SL government will continue to proactively develop a more stable, open, inclusive, and mutually beneficial international economic and trade environment in compliance with multilateral trade rules. We will also continue to strengthen our role as a connecting platform between our country and the rest of the world in the international circulation and as a key link for the Baron Road Initiative, Hong Kong's external trade. The mainland and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, are the largest and second largest trade partners of Hong Kong, respectively. We will continue to strive to introduce more liberalization measures under the framework of the mainland and Hong Kong closer economic partnership arrangement, thereby creating more favorable conditions for Hong Kong enterprises to enter the mainland market. The free trade agreement and the related investment agreement between Hong Kong and ASEAN, both of which came into full effect last year, have been implemented smoothly. ASEAN members welcome Hong Kong's interest in seeking accession to the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP, the SAR government is pressing ahead with Hong Kong's early accession to the RCEP. Apart from our major trading partners, we will also continue to seek to enter into FTAs and IAs with other economies. We also strive to strengthen economic and trade connections with the economies in the Middle East and attract enterprises there to do business in Hong Kong through the newly established Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Dubai, Trade Single Window. The government has implemented the trade single window in phases since 2018 to enable one-stop lodging of business to government import and export documents with a view to enhancing cargo clearance efficiency. Services under phase two are expected to be rolled out in batches from next year onwards. We have also earmarked about $1.4 billion for the development of the IT system in phase three, and the industry is being consulted on the relevant implementation details. Our target is to submit the funding application to the LESCO in the next financial year with a view to achieving full implementation of the TSW as early as possible, trade promotion. The government has previously made arrangements to allocate an additional sum of 835 million in total to the TDC in six years from 2018 to 19 onwards for the implementation of various measures with a view to consolidating Hong Kong status as a business hub in Asia and exploring business opportunities for Hong Kong companies. In the coming year, the TDC will continue to enhance its mega promotion, Think Business, Think Hong Kong, to strengthen its promotional efforts in ASEAN and mature markets. Moreover, it will actively develop digital platforms to help Hong Kong enterprises explore business opportunities and develop overseas markets. The TDC will also organize a number of events to introduce Hong Kong products and services to the mainland market. Convention and exhibition activities are crucial for developing Hong Kong's external trade and attracting foreign investment. As at the end of January, government has subsidized 118 CNE events under the Convention and Exhibition Industry Subsidy Scheme launched not long after the onset of the COVID-19 outbreak. The scheme also provided one of immediate relief to organizers of 73 recurrent exhibitions in Hong Kong. The government will actively consider attracting more event organizers to organize CNE activities in Hong Kong when the epidemic situation stabilizes. Rental enforcement moratorium. Many SMEs currently face huge challenge amidst the adverse business environment. Taking into account or into consideration that rental payment constitutes a major pay part of the operating expenses of enterprises, we will ex expeditiously introduce new legislation to prohibit landlords from terminating the tenancy of or not providing services to tenants of specified sectors for failing to settle rents on schedule 
or taking relevant legal actions against them. The relief will be valid for three months and, if necessary, be extended one more time for the same duration with the legislation automatically lapsing after six months. The arrangement will provide enterprises in deep water with breathing space and help secure employment. HKMA will be in close communication with the banking sector and banks will exercise flexibility if the repayment ability of any landlord is affected owing to reduction in his rental income. Support scheme for pursuing development in the mainland to facilitate Hong Kong businessmen, professional service practitioners and entrepreneurs in the mainland in better integrating into the overall development of our country and seizing the opportunities there, I will allocate a total funding of $135 million to the TDC over the next three years for the introduction of the support scheme for pursuing development in the mainland. The scheme will focus on those mainland cities with larger numbers of Hong Kong business people and workers with priority accorded to the GBA. Through the TDC's network of offices in the mainland, training and exchange programs, business missions, as well as promotion activities will be organized in partnership with various business associations to further support Hong Kong people in the mainland, include, including business chambers, professionals, groups, and associations of young entrepreneurs. Building capacity. Land and manpower are the two major constraints on Hong Kong's economic growth. In order to ease these constraints, we must make vigorous efforts to create land and nurture talent. Doing so will not only make Hong Kong a better place in which to live and work, but also enable us to scale new heights in economic development, thereby maintaining social stability. Northern Metropolis and Lantau tomorrow. Both the Northern Metropolis Development Strategy and Lantau Tomorrow Plan are important initiatives for increasing land supply, through which housing supply can be substantially increased. The Northern Metropolis will provide ample land for INT uses, which will foster INT development in Hong Kong. Hong Shui Kyo Hachun can also be developed into the new territory's North Modern Services Center. As regards development areas, including Sun Tin, Technopol, Lo Wu, and Kem To, Comprehensive Development Low, Macho Long, as well as Lao Fao Shan, Chin Bei Choi, and Park Nai, the government is striving to formulate development plans for the four land formation projects within two or three years. We will also step up the implementation of the new development areas projects to ensure timely completion of the housing projects. On financial arrangements, I will set aside $100 billion from the cumulative return of the future fund to set up a dedicated fund under the Capital Works Reserve Fund in order to expedite the implementation of infrastructure works relating to land, housing, and transportation within the northern metropolis. As for Lantau tomorrow, the studies relating to artificial islands in the central waters commence in last June. It is expected that preliminary proposals will be put forward in the fourth quarter of this year. The government is considering streamlining the procedures with a view to further advancing the development timetable that is commencing the first phase of reclamation before the original date of 2027 with the first batch of population intake before 2034. We will make financial assessments when conducting relevant studies and explore the use of different approaches and financing options, including bond issuances or public-private partnerships, etc., to take forward the projects. Transport infrastructure. The provision of comprehensive infrastructure support is crucial for the implementation of the major development projects mentioned above. Infrastructure-led and capacity building planning approach means that transport infrastructure will be used to drive the development of land. The expansion of the railway network will support NDAs and other new development projects, unleash the development potential of nearby areas and facilitate revitalization revitalization, development, and economic activities in the districts. The government is actively taking forward a series of new railway projects, among which the environmental impact assessment studies for the Northern Link and Hong Shikyo Station projects have commenced, while the railway schemes for the Tongzhong Line extension and Tumun South extension were already constructed. We are exploring the layout of railway and major road infrastructure in the, new ter in the, new in the territory, having regard to the development strategy set out in the Hong Kong 2030 Plus towards a planning vision and strategy transcending 2030. These studies are conducted to ensure that the planning of infrastructure will cater for or even reserve capacity to meet the overall long-term development needs of Hong Kong, including the development strategy. Besides, this transport department has launched a traffic and transport strategy study to lay down the visions to, for Hong Kong's traffic and transport policies until 2050 and draw up a strategy blueprint. Kong can build a safe, reliable, environmentally friendly, and efficient traffic and transport system. Talents and labor force. With an aging population and a declining birth rate, 
Hong Kong's workforce is expected to shrink. To ensure the sustainable development of Hong Kong's economy, apart from ensuring an adequate local supply of human resources, we should also enhance the quality of our workforce and attract talents to Hong Kong. I shall now elaborate on measures for enriching our local talent pool, which include providing talent, uh, pro providing training to talent, enhancing the skills, knowledge, and creativity of our manpower resources, and attracting talents from outside Hong Kong. Financial services. Having regard to the new trend of developing low carbon and sustainable economy, we plan to launch a three year pilot, pilot green and sustainable finance capacity building support scheme. Under this scheme, subsidies will be provided for the training and acquisition of relevant professional qualifications so as to encourage practitioners in the financial and other relevant sectors to participate in the training. We are also actively implementing the developments of professional qualifications recognized under the qualifications framework for fintech practitioners. The first batch of fintech professional qualifications for the banking sector is expected to be rolled out this year. We will also implement the pilot scheme on training subsidy for fintech practitioners this year. Practitioners who have attained fintech pro professional qualifications can receive reimbursements of 80% of the tuition fees. 1,500 places will be offered. We will conduct a consultancy study this year with a view to continuing develop with a view to continuing developing fintech professionals' qualifications for different financial sectors, thereby promoting comprehensive professional developments of fintech talent. The estimated expenditure of the scheme is $43 million. Besides, we have commissioned the Cyberport to implement a new round of financial practitioners' fintech training program this year to provide training programs and tuition fee subsidies for practitioners in the insurance and securities sectors. Subsidies will also be provided for the two sectors to organize their own training programs. Innovation and technology. The HJSTPC and the Cyberport continue to provide young people with in internship and training opportunities through various schemes. The Hong Kong SAR government has also launched a number of schemes such as the STEM inter internship scheme and the research talent hub to provide incentives or subsidies for graduates to pursue a career in INT. At present, the Technology Talent Ambition Scheme provides a fast track to, pro to process entry applications of individuals undertaking R&D work. The Global STEM Professorship Scheme, on the other hand, supports universities in recruiting internationally renowned R&D scholars and their teams to conduct research and teaching activities in Hong Kong. We will consider rolling out more relevant measures to facilitate the entry of talents into Hong Kong in due course. Healthcare. To step up our efforts in coping with the continuous healthcare manpower shortage in the future, I intend to gradually increase recurrent allocation up to $400 million a year as needed for enhancing training for medical professionals starting from the 2023 to 24 school year onward, including providing subsidies for students to enroll in taught postgraduate programs on healthcare offered by university grants committee funded universities, self-financing post-secondary institutions or public medical institutions. Students who have successfully completed the programs can become medical professionals. Meanwhile, 500 more designated places will be provided under the study subsidy scheme for designated professions sectors to provide subsidies for students to take self-financing undergraduate programs on health care. Besides, I will ask the FHB and the HA to explore waiving the clinical practicum training fees payable by tertiary institutions to the HA in respect of their subsidized undergraduate programs and postgraduate programs on healthcare. Apart from the earmarked sum of $20 billion as announced in the 2018 policy address, I will set aside another $10 billion for the completion of the works to upgrade and increase the healthcare teaching facilities of the University of Hong Kong, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Upon completion of the proposed facilities, the three universities will have the capacity of coping with about 900 additional healthcare training places. Arts and culture. I will allocate $37 million over the next six years to provide professional training for the 
conservators of the LCSD and those of the Hong Kong Palace Museum, which will be open soon, as well as increase the number of places under the Museum Trainees Conservation Program and the Summer Internship Program. It is expected that the measures will benefit more than 150 people. I will also inject $100 million into the Cantonese Opera Development Fund to further support Cantonese opera practitioners in enhancing their professional standards and pursuing continuous training with a view to facilitating the long-term development of the Cantonese opera sector. It is expected that the measure will benefit 800 Cantonese opera practitioners. Construction industry. In order to train more new blood and upskill in service, in service workers, I propose to allocate billion dollar concept training, which includes increasing the training places and the amount of allowance for trades facing labor shortage to attract new entrants and job changes to the industry, and increasing the training places for upgrading semi-skilled construction workers to skilled workers and the amount of allowance. We we'll also set up step of efforts to promote the professional image and career prospects of the construction industry in order to attract more young people to join. We established the Center for Excellence for major projects leaders in 2019 with the aim of equipping public offices with a more innovative mindset and enhanced leadership skills for taking forward public works projects. I've set aside $30 million for extending the training of the center to stakeholders outside the government, including projects related personnel of major public organizations, as well as those working for consultants and contractors engaged in public works projects. We have viewed enhancing the overall performance of works projects and jointly taking forward our long-term major development plans. Quality Migrants Emission Scheme. Upon completion of a review of the talents list of Hong Kong under the Quality Migrants Emission Scheme earlier on, the government has added to the list the professions of professionals in compliance and in assets management and financial professionals in environmental, social and governance, expanded the scope of some existing professions to include experts of medical and healthcare sciences, microelectronics, integrated circuit design and arts technology, as well as refine the requirements on legal and dispute resolution professionals. This is to complement Hong Kong's policy direction to accord priority to the development of finance, INT, arts and culture, as well as dispute resolution services in the future and attract more targeted talents to Hong Kong. Vocational and professional education and training. In addition, the government has been actively promoting the development of vocational and professional education and training by providing flexible and diversified pathways for young people with different aspirations and abilities with view to nurturing talents required for the development of Hong Kong. The pilot incentive scheme to employers and the pilot's international study program under the training and support scheme, as well as the pilot study scheme, a pilot subsidy, subsidy scheme for students of professional part-time programs have been implemented by the Vocational Training Council of VTC to facilitate workplace learning and assessments, broaden learners' horizon, and encourage continuing education among the, work the working population. The government has decided to extend these schemes for two years to benefit more trainees. The government is currently reviewing the Diploma Yijin subsidy scheme and enhancing the program curriculum. The scheme will be, re will be regularized starting from the 2023 to 24 school years school year to continue supporting secondary six school leavers as well as adult learners in securing employment and pursuing further study. Encourage continuing education. To keep on promoting continuing education and encouraging members of the public to pursue self-enhancement, the government will raise the subsidy ceiling of the Continuing Education Fund or CEF from $20,000 to $25,000 per applicant and remove the upper, lim upper age limit. This new initiative will benefit 760,000 people, more eligible, uh, 760,000 more eligible persons, as well as those who have opened a CEF account. Building a livable city, land supply. The current term government adopts a multi pronged strategy to actively ex expedite land supply for housing. There has been a steady land supply for private housing developments over the past five years, involving around 86,000 units. It is estimated that the overall land supply in year 2021 to 22 can provide about 20,000 units, around 7,000 more than the supply target. Looking ahead, the 2022 to 23 land sale program will comprise a total of 13 residential sites and four commercial sites capable of providing about 8,000 residential units and about 300,000 square meters of commercial floors, floor area, respectively. With the residential sites under the land sale program, together with railway property developments, private de private developments and redevelopment projects, as well as the urban renewal authorities projects, the potential land supply for the whole year is expected to have a capacity of providing about 18,000 units. 
As for land supply for private housing developments in the short to medium term, we will secure approximately 103 hectares of land in the coming five years and make available to the market sites for the production of over 57,000 units through land sales or putting up railway property developments for tender. Among such land, nearly 40% comes from NDAs or new town extensions, another 40% from other districts under the government's land sale programs, and the remaining from railway property developments in design stage. The above figures have not taken into, taken into account URA projects and other private land development projects. In the coming year, I will introduce various enhancement measures to expedite the process, optimize land use, and promote the application of INT in the construction industry with view to speeding up the use of land and housing production. Streamline statutory procedures. The Development Bureau is pressing ahead with the review of the land development legislation with a view to stream streamlining development processes and statutory procedures and hence shortening the time of land creation. We plan to introduce amendments built into the Lash Code within this year, hoping that all sectors of the community will support the reform so that the various reclamation works and NDA projects as well as public and private housing projects can be completed as soon as possible. Develop multi-story industrial buildings. With the launch of various large-scale NDA projects, many brownfield operations in the NDAs will inevitably be affected by land resumption. The government has engaged a consultancy firm to conduct a market-sounding exercise to gauge market interests. With the benefits of this exercise, the government initially tends to identify sites in Hongshui Kiu and Yunlong for the development of multi-story industrial buildings by leveraging market forces. These buildings will be mainly used by logistics and automobile automobile repairing industries and will provide space for other appropriate uses and for brownfield site business operators affected by land resumption. The Development Bureau seeks to sell the first piece of land concerned by public tender next year. Promotes the adoption of innovation and technology in the construction industry. I allocated $1 billion in year 2018 to set up the Construction Innovation and Technology Fund, or the CIDF, to boost the capacity of the construction industry to adopt new technology. After operating for more than three years, the CIDF is delivering results, and I propose to inject another $1.2 billion for its ongoing operation and implementation of enhancement measures launched recently, including expanding the funding scope and increasing the funding ceiling. Besides, I have earmarked $30 million to promote applied R&D as well as the adoption of new materials and innovative construction technologies in public works and the industry in the coming three years with a view to enhancing the overall productivity and performance of the construction industry. Further encourage the adoption of modular, modular integrated construction method. Modular Integrated Construction, or MIC, helps substantially shorten construction time, address the problem of manpower shortage in the industry, and reduce the environmental impacts brought by construction works. To expedite housing supply, the government will introduce more concessionary measures to encourage the adoption of MIC, including increasing the concession of floor area from the current 6% to 10% and providing corresponding site coverage concession as well, as well as supporting applications for exceeding building height limits due to increase in floor area caused by the adoption of MIC. The government will put the above measures in place in the middle of this year. Housing supply. The government has identified some 350 hectares of land for the provision of about 330,000 public housing units to meet the demand for about 301,000 public housing units in the next 10 years. Of these 330,000 units, about one third are scheduled for completion in the first five year period with the remaining in the second five year period. On private housing, it's estimated that the, the completion of private residential units will average over 19,000 units annually in the five years from 2022 onward, representing an increase of about 14% over the annual average of the past five years. The projected first-hand private residential unit supply for the next three to five, three to four years is 98,000 units, reaching a new high in recent years. Besides, the government has already identified sufficient land for the provision of more than 17,000 transitional housing units. About 2.3 thousand units are already in operation. In addition, more than 4.2 thousand units are under construction and are expected for completion this year. It is expected that another 11,000 more units will be completed for operation by the end of next year. Mortgage Insurance Program. Over the years, the government has been suppressing investors and speculators' demand for local property while striving to assist people in buying their own homes. At the end of 2019, the government relaxed the Mortgage Insurance Program of the HKMC Insurance Limited. 
public response was positive with the property market remaining stable. Given the current market condition, the supply in the next few years and the need to provide assistance for the first time home, first time home buyers and families seeking self-occupied flat for flat, I have instructed the HKMC Insurance Limited to make amendments to the MIP. For those home buyers and families, the cap on the value of a property eligible for a mortgage loan of a maximum cover of 80% loan to value ratio will be raised from 10 to $12 million. For first time home buyers, the cap on the value of a property eligible for a mortgage loan of a maximum cover of 90% LTV ratio will be raised from the existing $8 million to $10 million. The HKMC Insurance Limited will announce the details later. As for other property demand management measures, we have no plan for relaxation. Building a green city. To strive to achieve carbon neutrality before 2050, the government will implement strategies and measures to reduce carbon emissions in accordance with the Hong Kong Hong Kong's Climate Action Plan 2050 published last year. And currently, the government will continue to promote new energy and transportation so as to further enhance air quality. Over the past few years, resources have been allocated in the budget to take forward the building of a green city and implement a range of measures on various fronts to combat climate change. Green Tech Fund. I will inject an additional funding of $200 million into the Green Tech Fund with a view to further promoting decarbonization and enhancing environmental protection in Hong Kong. The first round of GTF applications received an overwhelming response and the second round of applications has commenced. The funding injected will primarily be used to subsidize projects in priority areas such as net zero electricity generation, energy saving and green buildings, green transport and waste reduction, which will in turn help support innovation and create job opportunities for the INT industry. Some 40 additional projects can be funded with a new injection, charging facilities for electric vehicles. The government launched the $2 billion EV charging at home subsidy scheme in October 2020 to promote the installation of EV charging enabling infrastructure and car parks of existing private residential buildings. Given the overwhelming response, we will inject an additional sum of $1.5 billion to extend the scheme for four years to the 2027 to 28 financial year. The scheme will support the installation of EV charging enabling infrastructure for a total of about 140,000 parking spaces in some 1,000 existing private residential buildings, accounting for about half of the eligible parking spaces in Hong Kong. The government is preparing to gradually convert some existing petrol or liquefied petroleum gas filling stations into quick charging stations so as to support the provision of charging services for more diverse types of vehicles. We will also explore the feasibility of developing some larger filling station sites under the single site multiple use model. Enhance the capability of the low lying areas to withstand threats. Climate change will lead to rising sea level and extreme waves. To enhance the capability of the coastal areas in responding to climate change, the government plans to earmark funding in the next five years to take forward improvement projects and management measures for 26 low-lying or windy residential areas that are prone to high risk. We will also commence strategic studies on coastal management with a view to providing guidelines on planning and land use as well as formulating the related long-term strategies and preventive measures. In addition, we will seek funding approval of about $8.4 billion this year for carrying out drainage improvement works in various districts to enhance the flood control ability, quality living. In order that Hong Kong people and tourists can enjoy the diverse, diverse cultural heritage, the beauty of the harbour front and the enhanced cultural spots and recreational facilities in Hong Kong, we will take forward our work in the following areas. Enhanced water, enhanced harbour front. The current time government has allocated $6.5 billion for developing new harbour front promenades and open space as well as improving harbour front facilities. In 2021, a total of 13 new harbour front sites, including the harbour steps at Wan Chai, Water, Wan Chai Harbour Front, were opened, providing the public with more well-connected open space in close proximity to the Victoria Harbour and giving them a variety of waterfront experience. In the coming year, we will continue to adopt the incremental approach in taking forward our plans to open the Hoi Shum Park extension in Kowloon City 
in the first section of the promenade under private development in the Kitech former runway area. This will extend the Victoria Harbour promenade by one kilometer to a total length of 26 kilometers. Sports development. The government has been proactively promoting sports development with new resources allocation of more than $60 billion since 2017 for promoting sports in the community, supporting elite sports and maintaining Hong Kong status as a center for major international sports events, as well as for providing more sports and recreational facilities. These efforts encourage collaboration among different sectors of the community in fostering a strong sports culture. In 2019, the government injected $6 billion into the Elite Athletes Development Fund to subsidize the provision of comprehensive support to athletes through the Hong Kong Sports Institute. We also injected $250 million into the Hong Kong Athletes Fund in 2020 to encourage more athletes to commit to full-time training, as well as dual track development in sports training and academic studies. I'm delighted to see that Hong Kong athletes achieve outstanding and encouraging results in international sports events last year, and I hope more young people in Hong Kong will pursue a career in sports, develop their potential, and bring glory to Hong Kong. Besides, we are pressing ahead with the Kitech Sports Park project, which is scheduled for completion by the end of next year. We are also proactively implementing the $20 billion five-year plan for sports and recreational facilities and taking forward the construction and upgrading of community sports and recreational facilities. Meanwhile, we are progressively carrying out the five-year plan to transform the public place spaces managed by the LCSC cultural facilities. As announced in the 2018 to 19 budget, the government would set aside $20 billion for the improvement and development of cultural facilities in the following 10 years. We plan to seek funding approval this year to take forward the main works of a cultural center in Fenling, the construction of Yama Te Theatre Phase 2, as well as the main works of the leisure and cultural complex at Tin Yip Road Tin Shui Wai Project Phase 1, Community Art Scheme. Popularization of arts can enrich people's quality of life. Starting from the 2024 to 25 financial year, I will allocate $20 million per year to regularize the LCSD's community art scheme with the aim for with the aim of providing more opportunities for members of the public to take part in arts and cultural activities, thereby promoting the integration of arts into our community. Over the past decade or so, we have allocated a total of $2.4 billion for the revitalizing historic buildings through partnership scheme, under which 19 historic building conservation projects have been launched so far. Through the financial assistance for maintenance scheme on built heritage, we have also assisted private owners in carrying out proper maintenance works for 71 historic buildings. Moreover, we are committed to enhancing public awareness of conservation of historic buildings and supporting relevant academic research. The Built Heritage Conservation Fund has subsidized many successful revitalization projects, such as Taiyo Heritage Hotel, Lui Seng Chun, and Yao Chong Yi Academy since its establishment. These revitalization projects have become local highlights, attracting many people to visit during leisure time. They also enhance Hong Kong's appeal as a tourist destination, and many of them have won international awards for heritage conservation. I propose to earmark an additional funding of $1 billion for the fund with a view to further promoting the conservation of heritage and historic buildings, caring and inclusion. We will continue to strengthen community and residential care services as well as social work services to support the elderly persons with disabilities and children involving an additional annual expansion of over $1.9 billion. On residential care services, we will regularize three pilot schemes, namely the pilot scheme on multidisciplinary outreaching support teams for the elderly, the pilot scheme on residential care service voucher for the elderly, and the pilot scheme on professional outreaching teams for private residential care homes for persons with disabilities. We will also allocate additional resources to upgrade the standard of EA2 homes under the enhanced bot play scheme. On community care services, we will regularize the pilot scheme on home care and support for elderly persons with mild impairment and the speech therapy service of the enhanced home and community care services so as to help the elderly in need age in place. On the provision of additional welfare facilities, we will set up seven contract residential care homes in the multi-welfare services complex, which is near completion at Kutong North NDA, as well as a new contract residential care home under the development project at Queens Hill in Fenling. In addition, a neighborhood elderly center, a special child care center, and an early education and training center will also be set up in Area 54, Tim Moon, 
to provide community support and training services for the elderly carers of elderly persons and children with special needs in the area. We will also regularize the pilot scheme on social work service for pre-primary institutions to facilitate early identification of and provision of assistance to pre-primary children and their families with welfare needs. Moreover, persons with disabilities receiving subsidized residential care and community rehabilitation services will be provided with soft meals from October this year onwards to cater for the needs of users with a swallowing problem. Neighborhood Support Child Care Project. Under the Neighborhood Support Child Care Project launched in 2008, service, service operators recruit child carers to provide families in their neighborhood with flexible daycare, day child care services at home as a way to foster the spirit of mutual help in the community. To better meet the keen demand for day child care services, the government will review the implementation mode and effectiveness of the project, including the need for home-based child carers to undergo certified training and the level of their pay with a view to enhancing service quality as well as attracting more people to become home-based child carers. The review is expected to be completed by mid-2023. Public finance. The current term government has all along been adhering to the principles of exercising fiscal prudence, keeping expenditure within the limits of revenue, and committing resources as and when justi justified and needed in public finance management. We have also strived to enhance the transparency of public finance. Thanks to years of economic development and the hard work of our people, the fiscal reserve stood as about $950 billion when this term of the government took office, and subsequently reached a record high of $1.17 trillion in year 2018-19. The ample fiscal reserves had enabled the government to allocate additional resources in a prompt and decisive manner to defuse crisis over the past two years, including setting up the AEF with an injection of about $200 billion in total and implementing counter-cyclical measures on a massive scale to relieve people's hardship and stabilize the economy. Though consolidated deficits were recorded from 2019 to 20 to 2020 to 21 as a result, the positive impact of the above initiatives, along with our solid foundation built on the principle of one country, two systems, have turned the consolidated deficits projected in the original estimates into a consolidated surplus projected in the revised estimates for this financial year. Our fiscal reserves are estimated to stand as about $940 billion at the end of the current term of the government and will gradually rebound to over $1 trillion equivalent to 16 months of government expenditure during the five-year period in the medium-ranged forecast. On enhancing the transparency of public finance, I've brought back the housing reserve to the fiscal reserves since 2019 to 20, and also announced last year that the investment return of the future fund would be progressively reflected in the operating account. These measures will allow one to have a full grasp of the government's fiscal strength and help maintain our financial stability. striving to maintain healthy public finances. To address social aspirations and strive for service enhancement, the current term government has significantly increased the recurrent expenditure on social welfare, health care and education. Based on the revised estimates for the current financial year, the overall cumulative increase in the recurrent expenditure in these three areas will exceed 40% or close to $85 billion in dollar terms. In view of the very substantial increase in the recurrent expenditure from $361.8 billion in year 2017 to 18 to over $510 billion in the original estimates for this year, I emphasized last year that government expenditure should enter a consolidation period. I also announced an expenditure reduction program under which government departments were required to cut recurrent expenditure by 1% without affecting livelihood-related spending. Given the lasting effect of the recurrent expenditure reduction, we will not roll out any further expenditure reduction program this year. Otherwise, the cumulative impact may disrupt departmental operations and in turn affect the delivery of public services. We will, however, continue to examine carefully any new initiatives that will incur recurrent expenditure and strictly control the growth of the civil service so as to ensure that our long-term financial commitments are commensurate with the increase in our revenue. The current time government actively promotes the government's green bond program. Given that green bonds are issued to finance certified green projects and our commitments not to use the proceeds for meeting operating expenditure, they are widely accepted by investors. The issuance of green bonds 
will not undermine our fiscal discipline, but can relieve the government's fiscal pressure arising from the need to meet capital expenditure with existing resources, and hence further reinforce the confidence in our public finances. Increasing revenue. Hong Kong is an open economy with a relatively narrow tax base. Our revenue is susceptible to changes in the economic environment. To maintain healthy public finances, we follow the principle of keeping expenditure within the limits of revenue to ensure that the growth of expenditure is commensurate with economic growth. We also need to maintain the development and vibrancy of Hong Kong's economy and identify new areas of growth with a view to increasing revenue. A simple and low tax regime, one of the cornerstones of our success in maintaining Hong Kong's competitiveness is of utmost importance in, in bolstering our competitive edge. It is also closely related to our economy and people's livelihood. On the other hand, owing to the implementation of various policy objectives, enhancements of services, and inc an increase in investments in various areas of the community pursued by the current type of the government, public expenditure will remain at a relatively higher level. Our anti epidemic and the the past two years have also occasional expenditure. Given that government, government revenue should be commensurate with its expenditure, we need to implement measures to increase revenue without affecting people's livelihood so that we can broaden our revenue sources while maintaining a policy of low tax rates in Hong Kong. In last year's budget, I proposed to raise the rate of stamp duty on stock transfers as a measure to help increase government revenue in the short run. However, with the outbreak of the fifth wave of the epidemic, Businesses and individuals are generally under considerable financial pressure. Having regard to the current economic situation, I believe that this is still not, not the appropriate time to revise the rates of profits tax and salaries, which are major sources of revenue. We anticipate that the deficits will still be recorded in year 2022 to 23. In the medium term, with the implementation in 2023 of the international tax reform proposals drawn up by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, the introduction of a global minimum tax rate may help in increase revenue from profits tax. I also propose to introduce a progressive rating system for domestic properties to reflect the affordable users pay principle. I will elaborate on these two measures in the, late, in the latter part of the budget. Taking into account these new revenue streams, we expect that the government will start to achieve fiscal balance beginning from year 2023 to 24. In the long run, there will still be challenges in, in alleviating the pressure on public expenditure in the face of an aging population. The government will continue to explore different ways to broaden revenue sources and will initiate in-depth discussions in due course to forge a consensus on how to sustain healthy public finances to meet the development needs of our economy and society. Rating system. Revenue from rates accounts for about 3 to 4% of total government revenue. Last year, I announced in my budget a review of the rating system. Upon review, I propose to revise the rating system as follows. A. Granting raise concession in a more targeted manner. The government will continue to consider on an annual basis whether to provide raise concession in the light of the prevailing circumstances to allow flexibility for the measure. In addition, in view of the public concern over the multiple raise concession received by owners with multiple domestic properties under the current raise concession mechanism, we propose that for future raise concession for domestic properties, only those eligible owners who are natural persons can apply for raise concession for one domestic property under their name. Taking the raise concession ceiling of year 2022 to 23 as a reference, the new arrangements can save around $3.1 billion for the government when a one off raise concession is implemented in the future. And B, Introducing a progressive rating system for domestic properties. For domestic properties with rateable value of $550,000 or below, it is proposed that rates be charged at the present level of 5% of the rateable value. For domestic properties with rateable value over $550,000, it is proposed that rates be charged at 5% of the rateable value on the first $550,000 and at 8% of the rateable value on the next $250,000, and then at 12% on rateable value exceeding $800,000. This can better reflect the affordable user's pay principle. 
It is expected that about 42,000 domestic properties will be affected, accounting for around 2% of the total number of private domestic properties, with an increase of about $760 million in government revenue each year. The above revisions to the rating system will involve significant modifications on the IT system of the rating and valuation department. The government will implement the above revision proposals in phases. The proposal regarding rates concession for domestic properties will be rolled out in the first phase in year 2023 to 24, whereas the proposed progressive rating system for domestic properties will be introduced in the second phase in year 2024 and 25. The government will in due course consult the electrical panel on financial affairs on the outcome of the rating system review, the details and the implementation timetable of the proposals. New international tax standards. Last year, Hong Kong, together with more than 130 jurisdictions across the globe, pledged to implement the international tax reform proposals drawn up by the OECD to address base erosion and profit shifting, abbreviated as BAPS 2.0. As the global minimum effective tax rate under BAPS 2.0 only targets large multinational enterprise or MNE groups with global turnover of at least 750 million euros, it will not affect local SMEs. The government has been exchanging views with the affected MNEs on matters relating to the implementation of BAPS 2.0 and reaffirmed that we would preserve the advantage of Hong Kong's in terms of its simplicity, certainty, and transparency, maintain our the maintain the territorial source principle of taxation as well as minimize the compliance burden on MNEs when implementing BEPS 2.0. The government will maintain communication with the relevant MNEs to enable them to familiarize with the new tax rules as soon as possible. The plan is to submit a legislative proposal to the electrical in the second half of this year to implement the global minimum tax rates and other relevant requirements in accordance with the international consensus. At the same time, we will consider introducing a domestic minimum top-up tax with regard to the aforesaid MNEs, starting from the year of assessment 2024 to 25, to ensure that the effective tax rates reach the global minimum effective tax rates of 15%, so as to save Kong's taxing. Based on our rough estimates, the domestic minimum top up tax will involve an amount of about 15 billion Hong Kong dollars per year. Revised estimates for year 2021. To 22. The 2021 to 22 revised estimates on government's revenue is $682.7 billion, higher than the original estimates by 15.5% or $91.8 billion. This is mainly because revenues from land premium and profits tax are higher than the estimates by $43.5 billion and $32.4 billion, respectively. As for government expenditure, the revised estimate is $699 billion, 4% or $28.8 billion lower than the original estimate. This is mainly because the Operating expenditure is $18.8 billion lower than the estimates. All in all, I forecast a surplus of $18.9 .8, billion for year 2021 to 22. Fiscal reserves are expected to be $946.7 billion by the 31st of March this year. The civil service establishments recorded zero growth in this financial year. Departments have enhanced effectiveness and efficiency through prioritization, internal redeployments, and streamlining of work processes so that the workload can be handled even without increase in the civil service establishments. Estimates for year 2022 to 23. The major policy initiatives announced in the 2021 policy address involve an operating expenditure of about $10.4 billion and a capital expenditure of $4.7 billion dollars. I will ensure that adequate resources are provided to fully support the launch of these initiatives. Total government's revenue for year 2022-23 is estimated to be $715.9 billion. Earnings and price tax is estimated to be $251 billion, increasing by 3.3% over the revised estimates for year 2021-22. Having regard to the land sale program and the land supply targets of year 2022-23, Revenue from land premium is estimated to be $120 billion, decreasing by 15% compared with the revised estimates for 2021 to 22. Revenue from stamp duties is estimated to be $113 billion, increasing by 11.9% over the revised estimates for year 2021 to 22. Total government expenditure for year 2021 to 22 decreased by 14.4% with its share in nominal GDP projected to drop from the peak of 30% in year 2020 to 21 to 24.4%. 
Total government expenditure for year 2022 and 23 will increase by 15.5% to $807.3 billion. Public expenditure will continue to account for about 24.9% of GDP on average during the five-year period up to 2026 to 27 in the MLF. The recurrent expenditure of the current term government increased from $361.8 billion in year 2017 to 18 to $467.1 billion in year 2020 to 21, representing an increase of nearly 30%. Of this expenditure on education, social welfare, and healthcare, which are the three policy areas closely related to people's livelihood, accounts for about 58%. In year 2022 to 23, the estimated recurrent expenditure on education, social welfare, and health care accounts for 60% or $341.6 billion. Among these, the expenditure on health care has recorded the largest increase, representing more than double of that in year 2017 to 18. The government's target of zero growth in the civil service establishment will remain unchanged in year 2022 to 23, with the aim of ensuring the sustainability of public finances. It is expected that, as at the end of March 2023, there will be about 197,000 posts in the civil service establishment. Zhongkei, medium range forecast. The MRF projects mainly from a macro perspective the revenue and expansion as well as financial position of the government. From 2023 to 24 to 2026 to 27, a real economic growth rate of 3% per annum is adopted for the MRF. During the above period, the average annual capital works expansion will exceed $100 billion, while the recurrent government expansion is expected to drop by 1.8% in 2023 to 24. It will subsequently grow at a rate between 4.1% and 4.6% per annum. Regarding revenue from land premium, the forecast for 2023 to 2024 continues to be based on the average proportion of revenue from land premium to GDP over the past 15 years, which is 3.8% of GDP. I also assume that the growth rate of revenue from profit tax and other taxes will correspond to the economic growth rate in the next few years. In addition, the MRF reflects the bringing back of the investment return of the future fund and the proceeds of the government green bond program. Based on the above assumptions and arrangements, I forecast a deficit in the operating account in 2022 which will turn into a surplus in 2023 to 24. There will be a surplus in the capital account in each of the five years during the MRF period, except for the estimated deficit in the operating account in 2022 to 23, which is mainly attributed to the one-off relief measures and anti-epidemic expenditure announced in this budget. There will be a surplus in the subsequent four years. The above forecast has not taken into account any tax rebate or relief measure that the government may implement over the coming four years. Fiscal reserves are estimated at $1.065 trillion by the end of March 2027, representing 28.9% of GDP or equivalent to 16 months of government expansion. GTIC. Mr. President, members, Hong Kong is currently experiencing its hardest time in the fight against the epidemic, and we are facing enormous challenges. Yet, we do have great strength and staunch support to ride out the storm. As long as we are united in taking decisive action with firm determination and unwavering confidence, we can surely win the battle against the epidemic and our difficulties will eventually go away. After containing the epidemic, our next task would be to propel economic revival and accelerate medium to long-term development. To this end, we must stand high and stand firm to see clearly the big picture, better understand the long-term development trends, have a good grasp of the economic patterns, concentrate on the focal points and map out long-term plans while remaining steadfast against fluctuations in the short term. Meanwhile, in the face of the profound changes worldwide unseen in a century, and the complex external environment, we must plan ahead and get well prepared to guard against risks so as to consolidate our development path and achievements. Since reunification, Hong Kong has weathered many storms with its economic and financial conditions remaining largely stable. Yet 
amid the adversities, many issues have emerged, such as the imbalance in economic development, inadequate opportunities for young people to give full play to their strengths, as well as the distribution of economic gains, which have scope for improvement. Such issues need to be resolved step by step in the future. However, all these issues which have come, which have implications for social harmony and stability in the long run cannot be resolved in one stroke and have to be dealt with through the concerted efforts of our whole community. President, members, while every fascinating story is full of twists and turns, every success is spurred by the strength gained from overcoming setbacks. If there is one common factor, it may be that those who are striving to overcome setbacks and achieve success are all guided by firm determination and faith that they will be able to navigate through troubled waters. We deeply believe that Hong Kong can steer towards becoming a more equitable, just, caring and inclusive society. This year marks the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to the motherland, a landmark occasion that can usher in the start of a new chapter in Hong Kong's development. The implementation of the national security law and improvements to the electoral system have brought Hong Kong back on a track focusing on development. We are on course to embark on a new phase of good governance, which we all look forward to. Our country has always provided the strongest backing for Hong Kong. During the ups and downs of our development, our motherland has always given us staunch support, enabling us to write the next line in Hong Kong's success story. In the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, Hong Kong has a unique and irreplaceable role to play. On the back of our country's sustained and steady development, Hong Kong has a bright and promising future under one country, two systems. We share the same dream with our country. Together and united, we can build a better home with courage, wisdom, confidence, and action. Thank you. I now propose the question to you that the aforesaid bill be read the second time. In accordance with the rules of procedure, the second reading debate is adjourned and the bill is referred to the Finance Committee, Secretary for Labor and